CSE Cloud uh, 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 team for putting out this very exciting uh, webinar, which I'm actually here to ask a lot of questions from my speakers. And um, I, I hope to learn from them as well. So despite the establishment of a lot of evidence-based hypertension trials and treatment guidelines like the SPRINT, JNC, 7, 8, we're still equally confused. There's too many numbers, there's too much trials, there's too many subgroups. And um, I think here today, we have tons of dilemmas in the management of hypertension, especially in subgroups and certain comorbidities. And this view remains confusing to a lot of general cardiologists, especially across Asia PAC. So we have two sessions focusing on hypertension today. Uh, part one of the hypertension forum, which I'm chairing, will focus on hypertension management strategies among during this period of COVID-19 pandemic, after which we'll move on to how to manage a subgroup with blood pressure variability. And uh, the session two, which will be chaired by Professor Koji, will focus on women in pregnancy hypertension and for those subgroups with chronic kidney disease. So uh, I would like to first introduce the first uh, speaker, a good friend of mine from the Philippines, Jorge Sison, the consultant adult cardiologist from uh, McCarthy Medical Center. And his uh, talk to us today would be hypertension guideline during COVID-19 pandemic, the Asia Pacific uh, point of view, after which we'll, we'll take a quick Q&A before the second speaker. The spe second speaker will be Prof. Uh, Takayu Kishi, a Department of uh, Graduate School Cardiology, International University of Health and Welfare, Fukuoka, Japan. He is going to talk to us on treatment strategies for hypertension with blood pressure variability, which is also a very difficult subset to manage. And uh, we're going to hear his point of view as well. So without further ado, uh, Sison, uh, please uh, take it away. You thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you to the APSC uh, Taiwan Society for inviting me to share with you a very important topic on uh, hypertension guidelines in the COVID era. And I would like to share my slide. I hope everybody can see my slide now. It's good. So Please go ahead. The title. Yeah, thank you. The title of my talk is about hypertension guideline during the COVID pandemic point of view in the Asia Pacific. These are my disclosures. I start off with a case study that we see in our day-to-day -day practice. We have a case of a 63-year-old man, hypertensive since age 46. He's diabetic, smoker, sedentary. And then five days ago, he started to have cough, sore throat, myalgia, and slight shortness of breath. And he's been a regular Temisartan and aspirin. As you can see, blood pressure is okay, a little tachycardic, he is a little obese, and he has fever. When you do the examination, he has a rouse in the right lung field. So these are the laboratories uh, that we uh, requested. You can see there, there's a LVH, or it uh, looks like an old MI. And then when we did the uh, chest x-ray, truly there was a sign of pneumonia with cardiomegaly. And we have confirmed that this patient had really uh, got COVID positive on the PCR test. So if I will uh, look at the salient feature, we have a 62 male with uh, hypertension, all the risk factors, smoking, and all the symptoms I presented regular on temisartan, aspirin, and he has um, RALS and uh, signs of pneumonia, LVH, and he's positive for COVID PCR test. So our um, next move will be what to do. We're going to hospitalize. Are we going to start the COVID treatment protocol? Are we going to continue with aspirin? Are we going to change the uh, telmisartan to SCCP because of the uh, um, concern that we are raising nowadays? So here is my agenda for my lecture, uh, background, and then some epidemiology, and then the rust blockers concept, and then the guidelines 
across the Asian Pacific perspective. So first the background, we just a reminder that uh, the COVID-19 broke out first in Wuhan and then spread almost every country in the world. Millions were affected, many died and every day uh, all our life has completely changed. And it has been shown that the SARS-CoV virus has been detected in multiple organs so that we consider the SARS-CoV as a multi-organ tropic or has a multi-organ tropism. No? The prognosis initially was good with mild disease, but however, some patients or many patients will show sudden deterioration or progression and became uh, worse after the symptom onset. And then they end up with ARDS and significant manifestation of the disease. So it has been identified that uh, the comorbidities um, that did leads to a risk for uh, a COVID-19 uh, serious illness is age, you know, the older the age, the higher the risk. And then we see uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic lungs, and these are the, the, the prognosis, uh, prognostic factors for mortality in COVID. Now we go to the epidemiology. Uh, if you backtrack in March, where uh, we saw increasing data in Italy, in March there were uh, about uh, 3,200 COVID deaths. And then they saw that the patients who died had an average age of 78.5 years. And then almost 99% of them had at least one comorbidity. And one of the common comorbidity was hypertension in that um, observation in Italy, affecting almost 72% of patients. And half of them or more than half of them were taking uh, RAS blockers, ARBs or ACE inhibitors. So that began to raise questions about the role of the drug. Now there's another uh, study done um, in China showing that uh, the comorbidity, um, more, most common comorbidity is hypertension followed by cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So these are the top three comorbidities seen during those uh, early months of the COVID pandemic. And what, are the comorbidities that are related to high mortality in this study in China. It's COPD, diabetes, hypertension, and malignant tumors. Likewise, the number of comorbidities also uh, predict mortality. Now, at least one comorbidity will give you already a risk for mortality, but gives you higher risk if you have two or more comorbidities. Now we go to the uh, role of uh, renin angiotensin system and role of uh, renin um, angio system blockers. Well, we uh, be reminded of the RAA system. We all are fam very familiar with this cascade from angiotensinogen converted to angiotensin one and angiotensin two through the ACE uh, function. And the angiotensin II will, will act on uh, by stimulating the type 1 receptor to give you all the, uh, uh, the negative um, hemodynamic effects of angiotensin II, okay? But we are now focusing on another aspect of this RAS um, cascade, which is the ACE2. As you can see here, we are reminded that the ACE2 converts angiotensin one to angiotensin 1-9. And this with angiotensin 1-9, again, uh, it's uh, cleaved by the angiotensin converting enzyme to become angiotensin 1-7, which we think we see as a good guy because if we have angiotensin 1-7, it gives us the um, beneficial effects of vasorelaxation, cardioprotection, an antioxidant effect, anti-inflammatory, and all of these beneficial effects. 
On the other hand, the ACE2 is also converting angiotensin 2 directly to become angiotensin 1 7. So remember, if it's the angiotensin 1 7 that we like, it is beneficial for our hemodynamics. And we have also been um, informed and in the studies that the SARS CoV or the virus binds itself, the spikes of the virus, the coronavirus binds itself with that enzyme, the ACE2, to facilitate its entry into the cell, no? more particularly in the respiratory tract. And if, if we have uh, this um, coronavirus using the ACE2 to enter the cell, what happens is you downgrade the availability of the ACE2, which we like, you know, because the ACE2 converts the bad angiotensin 2 to good angiotensin 1 dash 7, and also angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 1 9. But because of the downgrading of the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, you leave, you, you prevent the conversion to the good ones, and therefore you leave high levels of angiotensin II to give its bad effect on the lungs, of the cardiovascular system, inflammation, etc. So in summary, we have uh, the virus, the SARS-CoV-2, and of course, we also remember the original one, the SARS-CoV. Both of them promotes the level of angiotensin II, as I've explained to you. And at the same time, they downgrade the availability of the X2 and prevent the um, conversion to the good angiotensin 1.7, which we prefer. So again, putting it in another perspective, if you have this um, virus entering the cell membrane using the ACE2, therefore you deplete the, 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 the cell membrane tissue ACE2 that is supposed to be the source of your plasma ACE2, so you lose deplete the plasma ACE2, which is important to cleave the angiotensin 1 to the protective angiotensin 1, 7. So this is what's happening uh, in the uh, theoretical aspect of renin angiotensin system and the coronavirus. And what happens if you have the coronavirus invading our cells, then it creates a lot of injury to the heart leading to uh, myocarditis leading to myocardial damage, the lungs leading to ARDS, hypoxia leading to um, um, respiratory failure, and also the vascular aspect and the coagulancy system are also affected, giving us thrombosis, hypercoagulability, endothelial dysfunction, and first coronary artery plaque rupture gives us cases of cases happening now in coronavirus infection or COVID-2. The fact that the SARS-CoV virus uses the ACE2 our cells, the vulnerable cells, it means therefore that the ACE2, when it is uh, expressed highly in one organ, it will be most susceptible, no? and that is the lungs. That is where it's most susceptible. And we, we thought that the ARB and the ACE inhibitors have been shown experimentally to increase or promote the levels of ACE2, as I have shown you in my previous slides. So therefore, we are concerned about the potential higher infection if we use these drugs, no? because of its uh, utilization of the ACE2 enzyme. But this was uh, debunked by Reynolds in his uh, retrospective court study of 12,594 patients tested for COVID, he wanted to answer the question, do antihypertensive medications increase the risk of COVID-19? He wanted to, ask, uh, to answer that question. And when he looked at the retrospective study, he saw that uh, out of these 12,594, 46.8% uh, had uh, COVID positive and 17% were severe. Likewise, in these 12,594 patients, 
34.6 were hypertensive. And out of these 34.6, 59% were COVID positive. That, this, that, that study was not designed whether hypertension can promote COVID, but this was just a uh, statistical finding. But what he saw is that 24.6% of these positive hypertensive had severe illness. And after analysis, he showed no increased likelihood for COVID using antihypertensive drugs, including rust blockers, beta blockers, and CCBs. And likewise, there was no difference in the risk of developing the severe COVID infection using any of these antihypertensives. This is an example uh, showing to you uh, that the likelihood of a positive COVID test is not related to the drugs. As you can see here, COVID negative, uh, uh, COVID treated with medication, and these are COVID patients not, not treated with medications. And you can see they have almost the same uh, figures with the ACE inhibitor, the ARB, uh, combined beta blockers, calcium blocker and thiazide diuretics. So we, we don't have to be afraid that the drugs for hypertension can increase the likelihood of uh, COVID. Now for my last agenda, I will run through the different guidelines during the pandemic um, from the Asian Pacific perspective. Of course, we start off with the uh, American Heart, the Heart Failure Society and the American College of Cardiology statement telling us uh, that they have issued in March uh, 17, there are no experimental or clinical data demonstrating the beneficial adverse outcomes with uh, using ACE inhibition. That's why we need more studies. Likewise, the European Society of Cardiology also stated there is lack of any evidence supporting the harm if harmful effect of the RAS blockers. And they recommend that we should continue the treatment of the usual drugs because there is no clinical evidence that these drugs can harm the patient. Now, there is this a statement from China a Society of Cardiology telling us that we should continue the drugs and those who are infected with SARS-CoV uh, should continue even the, the drugs. And regardless of the SARS-CoV infection, if there is a word change in blood pressure, then we should put more attention. If there is severe infection, respiratory support, then we should uh, individualize the use of ACE and ARB in the COVID patients. Even in Malaysia, you know, they echo the position of the European Society of Cardiology that there's lack of evidence on the use of rust blocker. So we continue, we should continue the, the, the use of these rust blockers. Korean society also tells us there is no evidence of rust inhibitors harming COVID-19 patients and therefore we should continue and maintain these drugs. The Taiwan society also tells us to continue our rust blockers, inhibitors, uh, because there is no evidence, but in case of shock or severe disease, then we have to discontinue the BP lowering drugs. Even in Indonesia, they tell us continue, do not hesitate the use of the rust blocker, in our country, the Philippine Heart Association and the Society of Hypertension also tell us, tell you, continue the rust blockers. Continue the rust blockers because they give reasonable benefit for our patient. We even have our um, uh, Asia Pacific um, organization called the Hope Asia Network telling us that um, the pre-existing hypertension may be common in COVID, but there's little evidence that it can promote COVID among hypertensives. And then is it safe to continue? Yes, as of May 20, there's no data showing harm using these drugs and therefore we should continue. And our whole um, 
study group also recommend that we use biomarkers no, in order to monitor our patients. And these are the biomarkers, the troponins for myocardial injury, D-dimer, the amino terminal or the anti-BNP, the creatinine, C-reactive, and then the IL-6 for cytokine storm. So for clinical practice guidelines, our Hope Asia group tells us that the hypertensive patients, older patients are at high risk, and then they're, they're more likely to develop myocardial injury and severe infection. Diabetes are likewise have to be closely monitored. They should be determined the biomarkers and also monitor the oxygen saturation of the patients. And the progression of COVID and the cardiovascular status should be monitored closely, looking, looking at the blood pressure, and then the hypertensive drug should be continued, what, what, what are monitoring any uh, hypotension or kidney injury. And in unmedicated COVID-19, we look at comorbidity and then they can be treated with CCB first if we are concerned about rust blockers. And then the physician should be aware of the physical manifestation of stress for this patient. So last, Let's go back to our patient. What will be our decision on this uh, patient with COVID? Of course, we hospitalize. We start the treatment with COVID. We should continue the aspirin. And I think you will agree with me, you continue with the telmisartan because of lack of evidence of harm. So my colleagues, let me summarize that COVID-19 causes multiple organ damage, causing it to, um, make, uh, making it a multi-organ Tropism. And hypertension is the most common comorbidity. Older age group and the presence of comorbidities increase the risk of death in COVID-19. The ACE2 is a receptor that allows the virus to enter the cells. <clears throat> and all the rust blockers are suggested to upregulate the ACE2. No evidence yet on, on the harm. There are no evidence that uh, rust blockers should uh, be uh, aggravating COVID and therefore we should continue. And the Asia Pacific perspective tells us that the rust blocker should not be discontinued because of the benefit that we get from it. With that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Wonderful, wonderful, Dr. Sison. That was, that was an amazing uh, lecture, very comprehensive and covered, I, I guess, everything. I would now like yeah, to take yeah. a quick uh, question. Uh, Dr. Sisa, maybe you'd like to stop share your slides. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So uh, can I ask uh, Professor Koji, I think to just re-summarize, I, I think, do yes. you believe that the current evidence is strong enough to refute the association of ACE or ARB interaction in the RAS system for the ACE2 receptor entry? After. Yeah, maybe yeah, you can okay. make some comments. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jack. And it's very important uh, question and also into important lecture. And there is uh, association between ACE inhibitor ARB and poor prognosis of COVID-9, or there is no association between them. But there are many uh, papers on that. But that is just the association. It does not always mean the cause effect relationship. I mean that even though there is an association or not, uh, it does not always mean ACE inhibitor or ARB exert beneficial effect or harmful effect on the prognosis of COVID-19. So it's very difficult to make a conclusion. But the, just the speculation, ACE2 is a protective uh, molecule and uh, well, as to also serve as a receptor for COVID-19, but in experimental model, model overexpression of S2 will put, protect the heart and the lung against the pneumonia. So some people claim that S inhibitor will be the beneficial, but it it's not conclusive because it just uh, most of the papers are just uh, uh, investigating the association. We need a prospective study to see whether the ACE inhibitor and placebo 
and to see the prognosis will better or bad uh, by prospective studies. So at present, there's no conclusion. So, but the comment uh, by George, all of the comment is right. right. Thanks. Uh, I think yeah. uh, very valid comments. And just to recap, there's no uh, uh, indication of harm now for using RAS inhibitors in this subgroup. And to also emphasize, more importantly, do not stop it, especially in a patient reduced EF heart failure subgroup beyond yeah. hypertension. Yeah. So that's even more important to reduce hospitalization unnecessarily by stopping this group of medication. Um, the, the other thing to emphasize is that there are ongoing trials trying to randomize using uh, Losata and even some CCBs to see whether it helps with COVID-19 infection prognosis. So before those trials come out, we do not know whether it's beneficial or harmful. And truly, I think the current evidence, I'm quite happy for what uh, Sison presented, saying that uh, there's no indication of harm. Can I now ask uh, the rest of the participants and the panel, uh, what epidemiological highlight or, con or, or pointers you would like to uh, tell your audience whether it's coming from Mongolia, Taiwan, uh, Bangladesh, or Philippines. For your country, do you have any uh, observations about COVID-19 and hypertension? The thing that I always had question on beyond all the risk factors you presented yeah. was yeah, a male. Yeah. From Bangladesh, yeah. And there is some, some there is some short, uh, not the very big studies, but the hospital-based studies where the uh, AC inhibitors or ARBs are being continued in the hypertensive patients without any mm -hmm. uh, adverse outcome in comparison with the other uh, antihypertensive or the other uh, no, no antihypertensive. So it is also in collaboration with the other findings of the different parts of the world. The question is the what the uh, Dr. Kozi said that the, the trial that was undertaking to, to see whether it is beneficial or not. It is a, a that will be a very good uh, uh, finding. If it is beneficial, then we can uh, uh, suggest the use of the ARAS inhibitors to the every patient of the COVID-19. So that is the question. But in, from Bangladesh point of view, we are very happy to continue the RAS inhibitors in the when there is indicated, even in the heart failure patients or the others uh, having the COVID-19. Jack, can I, can I add to that? Uh, in the Philippines, we are following our local guideline and we are in agreement to continue all, all the rust blockers that we are using because the, it benefited our patients with heart failure, pausema, etc. So we are not afraid about this concept of rust blockers harming our patients. So very much are in liberty to use, as usual, the rust inhibitors in our cardiology practice. I'm also interested to hear from Mongolia. Yeah. Uh, what is the well, mortality is rate like uh, Mongo in Mongolia, and uh, what is the situation of COVID-19 in your country? Well, uh, first, uh, hello everybody. And uh, in regard of uh, COVID-19, we have very uh, limited cases because we have. Uh, if yesterday, I mentioned we have closed our border in January uh, of this year. So we have all, only a more, little more than uh, 300 cases, which are uh, not uh, severe patients. We have no deaths yet, uh, fortunately. And all the patients are uh, treated in the infectious disease hospital. And uh, in regard of the AC inhibitors in the, the hypertension treatment, we continue as it is those patients which uh, having uh, first uh, among uh, 300 patients, not many uh, patients with hypertension. So we uh, try to uh, continue as they were receiving as the hypertensive antihypertensive treatment. So it's too early to um, to say that uh, there is a comparison uh, benefit on that, but we are happy to follow APSC's guidelines and other guidelines on continuation of. Uh, uh, you you are in a very good place to have just three hundred cases. Please uh, do keep that up, and we hope the vaccine comes to you before 
uh, it you can open your borders again. Okay. I hope you open yeah. it soon. Anyway, yeah. can I ask something? Some some in one center in Bangladesh, there is more than three hundred patients. Only one center, <laughs> COVID COVID dedicated center. Uh, but it, the situation has changed now. But in the during the uh, May, June, July, there is uh, such as the case that they, in a single center there is more than three hundred cases in Dhaka city. So yes. uh, very so, early for the Mongolians. Eh? I, I think in more populous countries, whether it's uh, India or Bangladesh, is amazing the numbers. Can I can I ask yeah. Dr. Uh, Professor Kishi? Uh, there's also an observation beyond what Sison presented that there's also a male predominance of COVID-19 cases. The male gender seems to be one factor as well. Do you have any speculation about why this may be the case? Uh, very good, uh, very good, but difficult question for me. However, um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm not sure. I'm not, uh, I do not have, uh, I, I do not uh, have the uh, adequate answer to your question. Sorry. No problem. I, I, I don't know whether anyone has any other thoughts because over and beyond hypertension, it's giving heart disease, diabetes, lung disease you see that more males do get uh, COVID-19 compared to females, and mm -hmm. they tend to do also worse in some ways. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm not too sure what's the reason. Uh, Prof Koji, you are... Yes, I have yeah. one com comment on that. Uh, actually, the S2 is a receptor and protective, and the S2 gene is localized in the X chromosome. Cro chromosome. So the uh, female have more uh, S2 uh, expression. So which might be protective against the COVID-19. So mm -hmm. one of the reason may be the uh, quantity of S2 is different between men and women. So thanks, uh, Prof. There's one uh, postulation that some people have mentioned that the X chromosome is double protective because of the S2 gene. <laughs> and it's not because males are less hygienic. So I'd like to clarify that. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I think, uh, is there any other comments from any of the other panelists, including the Taiwan side, Prof Lin? Any last comments before the next lecture on hypertension and COVID-19? If there's no uh, further comments, uh, maybe we can move on to the second lecture of the day by Professor Takuya Kishi. And he's gonna to speak to us on uh, blood pressure variability problems uh, in hypertension management. Uh, thank you to persons, um, I'm uh, Takuya Kishi. At first, uh, can you hear my voice, okay? Yeah, it's good, uh, we can see and hear clearly. Uh, title slide, okay. Slides are good as well, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, now, now start. Uh, I will try to uh, hurry up uh, my presentations. Um, um, again, uh, my name is Takuya Kishi from Japan. Uh, my university and lab are located at Fukuoka of the Kyushu Island in Japan. Kyushu Island is the west side of the Japan. So from here, uh, the Chinese Taipei is uh, equal distance uh, to from here to Tokyo. So uh, I. <laughs> I like to uh, go to the Chinese Taipei and uh, um, um, if possible, uh, I like to uh, meeting you. Now, uh, it's my great pleasure to do my presentation in this APC Cloud Forum in cardiovascular disease. Um, so in this uh, new journal and breakthrough in hypertension treatment part one, uh, I'll talk about the treatment of strategy for hypertension with blood pressures variabilities. Now, let's start. Uh, this slide is uh, today's goal. So all the blood pressure variability is worse than is hypertension. It has not been established as a trophic target. Uh, blood pressure variability is mainly determined by the bad reflex systems. The central arc of bad reflex system is disrupted in early phase of hypertension. The device reflex system is expected to improve the impaired blood pressure variabilities independent of blood pressure levels. Now in Japan, uh, 350,000 people are uh, died due to the cardiovascular diseases. Uh, this number is uh, 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 
maybe uh, twenty five percent of all all cause of death in Japan. In Japan, uh, among the various factors for this, as you can see, the hypertension induced cardiovascular diseases, as the uh, right blue bars, uh, is the worst. Um, more than the smoking induced uh, cancers as the uh, uh, Navy curse. So uh, we should treat more and more to hypertension. However, uh, various and many uh, beneficial anti-hypertension drugs are available in Japan and worldwide. So what is ametonis to, to target target uh, for the hypertension? That is the variabilities, uh, what we call the qualities of the hypertension. Uh, as you can see in this slide, uh, this is a, a schema from the guide on textbook medical physiologists. So multiple factors in various time constants is to miss the arterial pressures. Uh, in Y axis uh, indicates the power to change the blood pressures. The X axis uh, indicates the time constant from seconds to days. Uh, among these various factors, uh, as you can see it's the right side this red line uh, indicates the renal blood pressure natural risk relationships. Uh, so the renal and renal blood pressures uh, natural risks determine the uh, basal level of the blood pressures. Uh, in constant, uh, at the left, one, uh, left side, the black line indicates the bar receptors factors. The bar receptors uh, determine the blood pressure variabilities in the, the second honors. Uh, blood pressure variability is uh, worsened uh, uh, as the, uh, with the progression of the uh, hypertension or age or vascular aging or vascular resistance or vascular remodeling. So as you can see from left to right side, the increase of the blood pressures with the disruption of the blood pressure variabilities cause the cardiovascular events. So uh, cyclic homeostasis is mediated by large organs as you know. So who is the center? Of course, the brains. The brain determines the sympathetic activities mainly by bad reflex systems. This side shows the bad reflex systems. Uh, at the left side, the brain determines and uh, sends the blood pressures and determines the sympathetic outflows. The sympathetic activities go into the peripheral arc, peripheral organs, and produce the blood pressures. This proper uh, going to the uh, brains. This cycle, uh, cycle length is uh, just around uh, five to seven seconds. As you can see on the uh, right upper side, the brain, the center of rock of the red lines indicates that the blood pressure increase, sympathetic now is decreased. The blood pressure is decreased, the sympathetic now is increased. However, in the peripheral arc, the sympathetic activity is increased, the blood pressure is increased. So I combined this uh, central arc and the peripheral arc is the uh, light royal partners. So this is a normal condition. So how about the changes in the hypertension? In the hypertension, the central arc, not the peripheral arc, central arc of the blood reflex system is uh, shifted to the right upward. So the blood pressure is increased, the sympathetic nerves increase and uh, indicate the set point. So the body failure disrupts the blood pressure varieties uh, from green to red. Green is the normal uh, blood pressure changes and the red uh, is indicates the body of the uh, this is my papers, and uh, this one showed. Uh, this paper shows that the worsened the uh, uh, short-term blood pressure variabilities uh, due to the uh, shift of the central arc of the blood uh, body products controls. Uh, cyclic homeostasis uh, made it with multi organ system is also disrupted, and uh, blood pressure is uh, uh, is uh, stabi stabilization of the blood pressure is uh, disrupted. Moreover, as you can see, it's the left upper part, the dot line it indicates the normal condition and the uh, black line indicates the barrier of the uh, This is the normal part, part kidney and normal vasculars. As you can see, it's the barrier of the um, by the uh, 
break of the uh, bar baroreceptors at the uh, neck. Uh, Baroric sulfurous uh, worsens the blood pressure variabilities. However, uh, please look at the left lower side. Uh, this is the salt overload and baroric sulfurous. The salt uh, overload and baroric sulfurous disrupt the blood pressure variabilities more. And moreover, uh, the renal, uh, in the aspect of the renal pressure natural relationships, uh, there is two input into the kidney. One is the blood pressures and one is the sympathetic activities. The blood pressure is increased, the urine volume, uh, urine volume is increased. However, the sympathetic activity is increased, the urine volume is decreased. Um, so uh, there is two input into the uh, blood pressure and uh, blood pressure uh, natural risk relationships. So um, this is my study, but uh, blood pressure and body flex uh, factors equally regulate the brain urine volumes. So the body sphere was in the renal pressure, uh, renal pressure and risk, as you can see, is red lines. So the uh, body sphere cause the uh, worsen the uh, blood pressure paralysis but also the uh, baseline of the blood pressure because uh, renal pressure and natural relationship is worsened. So uh, I guess uh, I like to show that the baroque sphere is a major factor of the hypertension, uh, not only uh, in the uh, blood pressure variabilities, but also the renal pressure and natural relationship is worsened. So how to treat? Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the uh, recommendations. Uh, Afferent background of stimulations improves the body flex center arc from A to B, from A to B. A is the hypertension and B is the normal conscience. The so afferent background stimulation is beneficial. Um, how this, uh, how should we do the afferent background stimulations? Uh, one is the device therapy, but also the other is the uh, dilatation of the lung uh, use of the muscles, uh, use of the gastrointestinal organs, and uh, the other is uh, uh, salt restrictions. So the uh, salt intake restrictions, the excess, and the uh, happy life and happy meals uh, cause the uh, stimulation of the uh, afferent vagal, not afferent, afferent vagal stimulations, and uh, improve the baroreflex failures, the central arc of the baroreflex failures, and uh, maybe uh, improve the uh, blood pressure's uh, variabilities. So um, the recent Hippocrates says that walking is the best medicine, best medicine to us human beings. That's right. However, unfortunately, the blood pressure varieties do not have good evidence as therapeutic target and hypertension. So why? Uh, because uh, blood pressure varieties is improved uh, by the uh, blood pressure lowering therapies. So uh, we can assess the effect of the blood pressure, the improvement of blood pressure variability itself, uh, independent uh, of the blood pressure lowering effect. So um, various uh, guidelines is worldwide, is ESC or ACH or HA or AC or Japanese Circulation Societies. Um, there's no uh, clear uh, discussions about the blood pressure varieties as a therapeutic target in you know, hypertension. However, uh, recently, as you know, the device therapy is uh, progressive. Uh, why is the body reflex activations? Of course, the body reflex activations improve the body reflex failures directly. However, uh, now the body reflex activations uh, device is not the last result because uh, this device cannot sense the blood pressures. So uh, one way is the artificial bionic body flex system. Our uh, mathematical models uh, predict the blood pressure with various flares and normals. Uh, as you can see the left upper balance, uh, this is a, uh, this is the animal study, but uh, this is a real normal uh, blood pressure. Uh, our mathematical model predict the body sphere blood pressure varieties uh, from uh, real normal uh, variabilities to uh, uh, predicted by the spheres. Uh, in contrast, uh, our mathematical model predicts uh, normal uh, blood pressure varieties from the real body products spheres and blood pressure varieties. Uh, recently, uh, our colleagues uh, indicated that uh, smart body products mm -hmm. uh, system uh, 
as you can see, is uh, uh, strikingly alternate blood pressure varieties independent of the blood pressure levels. Um, in addition, I wish to focus uh, deep insight into the brains. Um, in this decade, uh, I have demonstrated that um, our human has the uh, basomotor centers uh, in the brainstem. Uh, this is the lost of ventral lateral measures, what we call alveolar lamps. Uh, in the alveolar lamps, the AT1 receptors uh, induce the reactive oxygen species uh, increase the stepastic activities. So in animal models, uh, we have demonstrated that the directory block uh, to the A2 receptors into the hardware localities uh, decrease the blood pressures, uh, decrease the sympathetic activities, and improve the blood pressure variabilities. So uh, we are now trying to uh, make a new uh, drug uh, to uh, affect the uh, hardware uh, directories. So now uh, this is the last slide, uh, this goes. So although the blood pressure varieties is worsen in hypertension, it has not been established as a target target uh, in the available uh, guidelines for the hypertension. Uh, however, the blood pressure varieties is mainly determined by the system. So central arc of the barrier system is disrupted in early phase of hypertension. So the device therapies for barrier system is expected to improve the impaired blood pressure varieties independent of blood pressure levels. So um, in future uh, clinical exper uh, uh, further experiment, uh, we should try to assess uh, the uh, improvements or uh, uh, interventions to the uh, blood pressure varieties in hypertension uh, has the benefit or pre uh, prevent the uh, future cardiovascular events or not. Oh, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Prof. Is uh, a very interesting uh, topic they presented. I, I must admit, uh, when it comes to this depth of knowledge, I'm not a domain expert, but I have uh, lots of questions for you. Maybe I can start out with questions by others. Um, anyone has any questions for Dr. Kishi before I start? Okay, uh, can I start the yeah. question? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Kishi. Very excellent lecture. I'm very much uh, interested in your lecture. And you said that the blood pressure viability uh, may not be established as a risk factor, but I think that the uh, uh, there are several evidence that uh, short-term uh, calcium antagonists worsen the heart failure, but the long-acting uh, calcium antagonists will be safe for heart failure. So that may be the indirect evidence that the blood pressure variability will worsen the uh, prognosis of heart failure. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, uh, so you said that uh, di sort of diet or exercise will improve the blood pressure viability, uh, it is very important. And then what will be the risk factor for the uh, blood pressure viability? For example, diabetes or aging or mental stress or, yes. Please. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, you you're recommended uh, mental stress or diabetes or solid intake or uh, mental stress, uh, diabetes or smoking, or, um, all of them uh, is the risk uh, for the uh, blood pressure, uh, disruption of the blood pressure varieties. Uh, especially uh, my clinical work uh, indicates that uh, smoking and obesity and the diabetes uh, in uh, younger people uh, cause the disruption of the uh, blood pressure varieties. Thank you. And any other questions from the other panelists? Just may I have, a, have one? Yes, please. Uh, is there, at the present moment, is there any therapeutic agent that may we advocate uh, for this, these patients? Uh, the, either the long-acting antihypertensive, it will be better for them, or the, if we use the short-acting antihypertensive in the multiple doses, what is the rationality of using the antihypertensive in these patients? So uh, I cannot hear the uh, uh, first part of uh, the, uh, the the thing is that what we may suggest at the present moment any therapeutic agent 
which might be proven to be superior to the other agent. As for example, if we can uh, give, him, uh, give him or her the long-acting antihepatency, is it uh, better or we, we should give uh, uh, the short-acting antihepatency in the multiple doses? Which one would be better for the case of the this blood pressure variability cases? Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, short time workers or uh, uh, beta workers, uh, some, sometimes uh, worse in the uh, blood pressure varieties. Uh, Surprisingly, short time uh, beta blockers are uh, worse in the blood pressure varieties. So, uh, in the culture channel blockers, uh, <laughs> we should do long terms, and uh, in diuresis, we should do long terms. And uh, my research indicates that the linear angiotensin system, in, angiotensin system inhibitors. Uh, <laughs> as the uh, new, neutral effects, uh, not to worsen the blood pressure varieties. So uh, we should uh, uh, use the uh, long-term uh, uh, calcium channel blockers, uh, diuresis, and the uh, linear angiotensin system inhibitors, uh, superior to the uh, beta blockers and the short-term calcium channel blockers. Any uh, other yeah. questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to be clarified, Dr. Kishi, your talk is uh, nice. About the sodium, uh, if I get it right, that uh, if there is sodium overload or salt overload, mm -hmm. it has uh, some effect on uh, blood pressure variability. Mm -hmm. Can you again explain that part? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, sodium overload uh, increases the stress volumes in, in the uh, human system. So uh, stress volume indicates the uh, uh, intravascular volume. So the intravascular volume is, is the preload to the uh, heart. So the increase the preload, the cardiac output is increased and the uh, uh, blood pressures uh, increase uh, independent of the uh, vascular stiffness. So uh, sodium intake, uh, sodium overload uh, worsens the uh, blood pressure varieties uh, uh, independent of the blood pressure uh, levels. So therefore, diuretic can be something that... Yes, yes that's right. So the uh, uh, diuresis uh, improves the uh, short-term blood pressure varieties in uh, various critical works. So thank okay. you. Um, any questions? If not, I may start my questions and comments. So um, I, I think the first thing I want to emphasize is that I love the data shown by Prof. Kishi about the impact of hypertension, in, especially in the East Asian cohort. Hypertension mm -hmm. is a real killer in Japan, Korea, China, and the Northern uh, Eastern Asian countries. While diabetes is a huge problem in our Southeast Asian cohort, we got an early onset uh, CAD. So I think, but it, it kills and it's difficult to control. My observation about this uh, bioreceptor reflex, <clears throat> my own comment is that I'm not too sure whether it's a marker of efficacy or is it a disease by itself. For example, you say excess salt, maybe obstructive sleep apnea, maybe other mechanism. It is just a reflection of disease and reaction to hypertension causes rather than by itself is abnormal. And I think it's also not easy to establish normal <coughs> range. And should you call the upper range uh, 80th percentile, 99th percentile before is abnormal. And what is the normal range in uh, elderly versus young versus anxious patient? Uh, I think it's very difficult and different loading conditions uh, may affect uh, bioreceptor. I think many years ago, there was actually postulated device therapy to use bioreceptor modulating devices to target blood pressure control, but that has seemed to have fallen out of favor. I, I suspect the data is not really strong. I, I wonder whether have you have any uh, data saying that this could be an index of device therapy success, whether it's direct or indirect, like renal nerve denervation, uh, whether it does affect baroreceptor, uh, sorry, uh, blood pressure variability. And what is the evidence to say that the variability kills more than just a ambulatory blood pressure measurement? And what is the variability range before it be considered significant. Uh, for example, you come to the office, a lot of white coat hypertension. Is that, because there's also a lot of debate saying that white coat is not benign, and whether that's also a reflection of uh, bioreceptor 
variability as well. Um, I, I know a lot of comments and questions. Maybe you, you take whichever track you like to answer, Prof. Yeah, your comments is quite interesting for me uh, because uh, um, that that is a problem uh, with the research of the pressure uh, parties from us and uh, we have no the interventional series and uh, how to uh, sense and uh, assess the uh, blood pressure parities in uh, clinical work. Um, of course, um, blood reflex sensitivity is not the uh, best uh, uh, clinical markers with the blood pressure parities. So um, your comment uh, is uh, encourage me to uh, do my research uh, in future. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I, I maybe one suggestion, I would love it that if you have a patient I suspect is white coat hypertension, instead of me doing uh, just an ambulatory blood pressure, maybe you can have some marker to say that this patient has excessive baroreceptor variability or blood pressure variability uh, in the white coat uh, hypertension cohort. I think in a lot of things, hypertension is controversial, even excessive salt intake I've seen debates saying that some people don't believe that excessive salt intake uh, increases high blood pressure. So um, too, too many controversies for me to handle. A any other comments or questions from the other panelists? Any, any comments? Uh, Prof Lin uh, from Taiwan, are you still on the line? Prof Lin is also an expert on this topic. I wonder whether he has any comments to make. I think uh, actually the reason I choose this topic is uh, it's really quite uh, difficult in clinical practice. It's uh, say the high core hypertension, mass hypertension. Yes. Sometimes it's difficult to say what is called viability. Mm -hmm. That's why we don't have uh, as much evidence uh, on this topic. Actually, our real serious problem is uh, in Taiwan, just like Japan, we, uh, have, we are quite an aged society, and uh, all aged people, they have uh, serious problem, posture of tension, yes, and yes. also a lot of uh, profit variability. Actually, I have the same question as Jack. The, uh, how do you measure the blood pressure variability? How do I choose the drugs? It's difficult. Sometimes uh, it's really difficult. Yes, yes, yes. That's yes. a COVID dilemma. Yes. I think so. Too. And the short-term blood pressure parities uh, can uh, assess the, uh, uh, by the uh, wearable device in future. However, uh, now uh, the wearable device is uh, uh, everybody can use the wearable device for the blood pressure uh, monitoring. And uh, uh, not the short time blood pressure parities, the uh, season or visit to visit or uh, many, many uh, uh, blood pressure parities in time constant. So um, today's uh, I focus is the short time blood pressure parities. So um, your, your question is uh, quite uh, quite uh, severe and then uh, uh, difficult uh, questions for me. So thanks uh, Prof Lin for those wonderful comments as well. We, we are not asking difficult questions of you, we're just, saying that uh, actually this is a topic that is very exciting because no one knows. I hope some of your research can then answer questions in terms of variability, in terms of mass hypertension, in terms of how to integrate this piece with our ambulatory blood pressure or office blood pressure measurement. I think all this, if you can bring it to clinical practice in a well thought out way and define normality and markers, this will help uh, especially our aging population in East Asia where there's a lot of variability mm -hmm. and what is the ideal agent for this group of patients. So we, we actually applaud you for your ongoing work and please work harder. Yeah. Too many questions to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I think um, if any other last questions for the first two speakers? Any comments or questions? If not, uh, I'm going to pass over the chairmanship to Professor Koji Hasegawa, who is also a good friend of mine uh, from the Kyoto Medical Center uh, from Japan. He's the immediate past president of the IICP. 
and he's going to chair the next uh, two uh, uh, lectures. Prof. Uh, Koji. Okay, thank you very much, Jack. And I'm Koji uh, from Japan. Uh, I'm going to take uh, the later uh, half of the excellent two, two speakers. The one topic is uh, hypertension in pregnancy. The other topic is uh, uh, hypertension in chronic kidney disease. Then uh, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Mungo Chung Meg Daguba. I think I, I had better uh, call you Mungo. Uh, uh, she comes from Mongolu. Uh, she is the director of the cardiovascular center uh, Shastin Central Hospital. She is also the president of the Mongolu Society of Cardiologists and fellow of the uh, European Society of Cardiology. Uh, she's going to speak treatment strategy for hypertension disorders in pregnancy. Uh, dear Mongo, please. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to share my. Uh... I see the message that host disabled participants screen sharing. Could you please allow me to share my screen? Can we allow uh, Prof Mongo to share screen? Yeah, can you try again, Prof? See whether it's possible. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, honored to uh, attend this uh, important uh, uh, symposium. And I would like to talk today. My topic is uh, um, treatment strategy on uh, during pregnancy. Can you share screen again and see? Right now, it should be okay. Okay. Okay, just a moment. No problem, no, no worries. We don't want to increase the blood pressure variability here, so just take it easy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me adjust a little bit to, to make it smooth. Okay, so oh. I hope it's visible now. Is it okay? Yes, like it's that? okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. So this is uh, the. I'm. I'm going to. Uh, the generally uh, the hypertension during pregnancy called to be uh, the hypertension disorders in pregnancy HDP, and this is a common pathology because uh, it is uh, complicating five to ten percent of pregnancies worldwide. And it remains a major cause of maternal, perinatal, also fetal, neonatal morbidity and mortality. And this pathology is also increasing year by year, looking to, uh, according to the latest, uh, one of the latest data that um, in, uh, if you compare in the United States, if you compare in 1987 to uh, uh, the 2004, the HDP is increased by uh, more than uh, 50, 25 percentage. So on top of that, uh, uh, the, on top of uh, the complication of uh, maternal side and neonatal side, the HDP is becoming a serious cause of uh, the woman's uh, cardiovascular disease risk. It is well established that women with a history of HDP have a markedly higher risk of future cardiovascular disease. For, for example, here it's, uh, it's shown that uh, cardiovascular, chronic hypertension, women with a history of uh, HDP has uh, uh, the risk, a relative risk of four point, almost two uh, for hypertension and uh, 2.5 for coronary heart disease. If you look to the, 
the prevalence in worldwide. I could uh, withdraw it from uh, several uh, recently step, uh, issued uh, publications that um, uh, there are uh, the data is available but not consistent. And also, for example, like in in our country in Mongolia, only preeclampsia is uh, solely well uh, registered, while others are lagging. Let me uh, quickly go through uh, definition, uh, classification of the HDB. It, uh, according to the ESC guidelines, it in, in, uh, includes uh, the five cat uh, subcategories, pre-existing hypertension, when the hypertension starts before 20 weeks of gestation, and the gestational uh, hypertension, if it develops after 20 weeks, and a chronic uh, hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia, pre-existing hypertension plus superimposed gestational hypertension with proteinuria and alternative um, preeclampsia and alternatively unclassified hypertension. If you look to, uh, to the subcategories, uh, sorry, I just want to hide. To... Okay. If you look to subcategories, uh, mostly predominant is the gestational hypertension in the preeclampsia, uh, counting six, five to seven percent of uh, uh, the disease. The general management of uh, on the diagnosis is including uh, pre-pregnancy counseling, blood pressure measurement. In this case, uh, it's optimal to uh, take uh, blood pressure in the office or if it's possible, uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and home monitoring is preferable and all the investigations, which is usually in all the guidelines. Preeclampsia, I would like to highlight preeclampsia and gestational hypertension a little bit because these uh, categories are most complicated uh, part of this uh, uh, hypertension disorders of uh, during pregnancy, because it com uh, not only because it's complication, but also it uh, implicates in the woman's father life. Women with preeclampsia have 71% increased risk of cardiovascular disease mortality uh, compared to normal tensives in 2.5 fold increase of coronary heart disease in four fold increase of heart failure compared with the normal cohort. And here uh, um, uh, you can see a preeclampsia and eclampsia is, is uh, the, having uh, uh, in, in the, even though uh, the etiology is uh, not completely uh, clear, but there are certain uh, factors uh, playing a role, like uh, metabolic syndromes, obesity, diabetes, hypertension. But also uh, if um, gestational hypertension and preeclampsia combined with this, uh, with uh, maternal uh, complications and neonatal complications like small uh, gestational age at birth, preterm delivery, it really complicate uh, and increase the, the cardiovascular uh, risk in the in, in postnatal period of uh, woman's life. Here uh, you can see that uh, the combination of these uh, four, uh, combination of these categories are increasing, uh, sub, um, markedly increasing cardiovascular, not only cardio, overall cardiovascular risk, and also hypertension, coronary artery disease, stroke, and heart failure in the general mortality in this. Okay, so um, that's why important uh, to consider how to, uh, on the prevention of uh, preeclampsia, in uh, most of the guidelines uh, stipulating that aspirin take in a low dose, uh, 75 to 165 milligram per day is currently the only drug recommended by professional societies for uh, prevention of uh, preeclampsia. And there are other uh, regular exercises, low molecular heparin in uh, 
early severe preeclampsia and the calcium supplementation is also recommended. These are uh, multiple guidelines on the management of hypertension in the pregnancy exist. These are the last two years only. There are many. And the number of studies issued in the published among them also. The chronic uh, hypertension pregnancy project is ongoing and it's going to um, uh, complete in 2021. And there are also, um, the uh, professor mentioned earlier that the SARS-CoV um, study with the pregnancy is issued recently. However, the number of RCT and the systematic review were conducted, updated, and certain conditions still exist. However, no clear consensus currently exists on the optimal blood pressure threshold at which to initiate uh, treatment and the target blood pressure to achieve. Let me show you a um, comparison of uh, clinical guidelines on uh, definition, treatment threshold, and the target blood pressure. As you can see, in ESC guidelines, the definition of uh, uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, there are five, pre-existing hypertension, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, uh, pre-existing hypertension with the superimposed um, preeclampsia and antenatally classified hypertension. While other um, guidelines, for example, in uh, American uh, uh, College of Obstetricians and uh, Gynecologists are recommending four classifications. And the in, uh, National Institute of uh, Healthcare is uh, recommending four definitions of uh, this uh, disease. If you look to uh, what is recommending in, uh, the, about the threshold of blood pressure to initiate antihypertensive drugs are also different. According to the European guidelines, if there is a gestational hypertension, pre-existing hypertension and organ damage, uh, pharmacological treatment has to start uh, equal and or more than 140 and 90 millimeter mercury. Um, otherwise, if there is no uh, supporting, uh, no uh, com um, uh, comorbidities uh, start above 150 and 95. An emergent treatment and hospitalization needed in case of more than 170 and 110 millimeter mercury. And uh, meanwhile, there are some um, uh, guidelines even not um, clearly uh, issued when to uh, threshold of blood pressure, when to start the treatment. If you look to the um, target blood pressure to aim, there are still uh, missing a clear recommendation what will be the target uh, blood pressure to aim. Also same, um, um, same statement in regard of, uh, um, uh, sorry, it's, it's not clear. Uh, okay. It's not clear. Um, uh, comparison clinical guidelines, first line and second line treatment also a little bit different, but here uh, most of the guidelines recommending uh, as a first line um, treatment for uh, the non-severe uh, hypertension the same group of uh, medicines like uh, metildopol, labitalol, and nifedipine, but a little bit differing in the severe and uh, second line uh, treatment. There are, uh, in regard of the, when to initiate uh, pharmacological treatment in the Cochrane Collaboration System Review, uh, covered uh, 49 uh, randomized uh, trials issued and revealed that the initiation of antihypertensive therapy in a mild and moderate uh, hypertension, halving the risk, the risk of the progression to severe hypertension. This is very good statements to consider. And this uh, study also showed that uh, meanwhile of that, no significant reduction of maternal and fetal complication were observed. In a study, um, a randomized clinical trial, a control of hypertension in pregnancy, there was also interesting, um, uh, interesting results. Um, this showed uh, that um, uh, these chips, uh, this uh, 
the CHIPS RCT proved treatment benefit in a tight versus less tight control of hypertension in pregnancy. Tight means uh, targeted diastolic blood pressure aiming to 85 millimeter mercury. In the less tight group, arm was uh, targeting uh, around 100 milli millimeter uh, mercury respectively. Among this uh, less tight group, the incidence of severe hypertension was high. In most ad hoc, most hoc analysis of the CHIPS trial, the occurrence of severe hypertension was associated with the increased risk of pregnancy loss, the need of, for high level neonatal care, low birth weight and preterm delivery. Okay, in the management of uh, pregnancy, uh, definitely the pregnant woman with the hypertensive disease has to be cared by the multidisciplinary team uh, cardio obstetric team, including obstetrician, cardiologist, anesthesiologist, and neurologist, even GPs. And uh, non pharmacological treatment in HDP is also important, but in uh, several studies, uh, are show, even though uh, several studies are showing that uh, minimal or low impact on uh, lowering uh, blood pressure that regular exercise may improve vascular function and prevent preeclampsia needs to be taken in consideration. In regard to pharma pharmacological treatment, this slide from American Heart Association guideline is uh, nicely illustrated that um, about the safety in the preferred drugs uh, medical treatment during the pregnancy. As we all see that, uh, uh, ARB AC inhibitors are contraindicated during pregnancy because of their teratogenic effect. But recently, some studies started to show that it's also um, um, needs more investigation. Otherwise, uh, beta blockers, um, the alpha agonists, calcium channel blockers, and the vasodilatators are commonly used in potential. We will discuss it later. And before starting pharmacological treatment, the potential risk of drugs and possible benefit must be weighted well uh, beforehand. And this is uh, pro um, they recommended also by guideline, guidelines. And uh, recent uh, Canadian guidelines showing that uh, nicely showed that uh, during the pregnancy, first line treatment, second line treatment in the medication with the safety. So still, um, we can see the, in regard of the first line, um, oral drugs can be metildopan, labitolol, and long-acting nifidipine. And the, while the second line can be clonidine, gidrolizine, and chazid diuretics. Uh, in the, uh, in the first line uh, treatment for non-severe hypertensive disorders, the most of the uh, studies are uh, started to a trend to show that nifidipine or nifidipine is uh, is suitable is available and affordable and also having a uh, good results in in um, in the non severe uh, hypertensive disorders and the dosage will be uh, 30 to 100 mg per day and here uh, the, in the comment column you can see the what is uh, the uh, recommended for or the, what are the difference from uh, all, all those uh, medications and adverse effects are also uh, stated here and a european uh, society of uh, uh, european societies guideline recently recommended that uh, when you choose a pharmacological treatment not uh, should consider not only fda's category of safety it has to be also considered all the guidelines uh, recommendation. So nifedipine, labetalone, and metildopa is a really first line choice for non-severe uh, HDP, while the second line treatment can be hydralazine uh, and the acid diuretics. The first line treatment on severe, uh, severe uh, hypertensive disorders, including also nifedipine, uh, oral uh, prescription, and labetalol intravenous uh, prescription because of the severity. 
and uh, central uh, alpha agonist like metildopa also can be used and hydrolysin as well as there are some uh, studies comparing hydrolysin with labitolol with the metildopa but there are not much difference in in those studies what to uh, keep in mind in emergency department is expeditious triage and treatment within 30 to 60 minutes of confirmed severe hypertension, which means uh, more than 160 and 110 millimeter mercury, persistent more than uh, 15 minutes should be initiated to reduce the risk of maternal heart failure, myocardial ischemia, and stroke and renal disease. And uh, blood pressure needs to be reduced to less than 160, uh, 110 millimeter mercury with initial reduction of less than 25% in the first hours of treatment. In contrast, if there is a, if there is a uh, end organ complication such as pulmonary edema or acute kidney injury, it has to be emergent. The first line treatment of uh, severe hypertension also uh, most commonly uh, involves a magnesium sulfate indication. In, in regard of magnesium sulfate uh, indication, the dosage and uh, what to care in the protocol was nicely uh, showed in the, in the uh, clinical practice guidelines of New Zealand 2018. Okay, the another important point in the uh, management of uh, HDP is postpartum period. Postpartum um, hypertension persists. Any of the recommended drugs are continued, except methyldopa because of the um, methyldopa's influence as a, um, postpartum depression uh, to women should be avoided. And in regard of the breastfeeding uh, women, uh, all the um, medications are in uh, uh, breast, uh, the milk, breast milk in a low concentration, but needs to be uh, careful in regard of atenolol, propranolol, nifidipine due to high concentration in milk and also prefer long acting cardio um, CCBs. AC inhibitors might cause hypertension, hypertension, particularly in premature infant needs to be taken into account. And as women are um, with uh, hypertensive disorders uh, during pregnancy can be uh, the, at high risk of development of further development of cardiovascular disease, especially hypertension. The woman uh, recommended to uh, screen for hypertension uh, in postpartum period well, and if there is a, a high blood pressure more than 150, 100, then initiate uh, uh, pharmacological treatment at, at two weeks after delivery, and has to be followed by uh, uh, um, phys physicians. Prevention of the cardiovascular disease according to uh, prevention in postpartum uh, in, uh, cardiovascular disease is well uh, illustrated in American Heart Association's uh, statements. Um, uh, what about uh, HDP in a, a patient with infected with SARS-CoV-2? And definitely uh, it's a complicated issue because of uh, uh, Already pregnancy was a hormonal uh, change in a woman, but on top of that hypertension plus immunal, uh, immunological uh, status is influencing and uh, making a, a woman to be uh, fragile for um, uh, the COVID uh, transmission. So the, my, uh, my, uh, my conclusion is to, the most importantly, to prevent from the contracting COVID uh, uh, SARS-2 is, is important. And what to consider in the treatment, uh, uh, the um, recommended uh, the pharmacological treatment, how is in, uh, interacting with the uh, um, antiviral drugs uh, uh, shown here in this uh, slide. And we have to uh, take care about the calcium channel blockers 
especially with the lapinavir and ritonavir expect to be toxic in the, during the pregnancy. And also uh, in regard of uh, beta blockers, safety administer, uh, safely administered in women with the HDP who infected by uh, SARS-CoV, but low molecular uh, heparin seems to mitigate the pulmonary coagulopathy often from, uh, promulgated by virus. And um, vitamins are listed in the last column. Uh, take home messages for, uh, from my uh, presentation, the threshold initiate antihypertensive treatment is between 140, above 140, 90 in women with the gestational hypertension, pre-existing hypertension and organ damage. And for other women above 160 and 110 millimeter mercury. An early indication initiation is associated with the low risk progress to severe uh, hypertensive disorders. Systolic blood pressure more than 170 and diastolic blood pressure more than 110 in a pregnant woman is emergency. Uh, emer is indication for emergency hospitalization and for urgent uh, pharmacological treatment. Non-pharmacological treatment recommended throughout the pregnancy period. Before initiate antihypertensive treatment, check drugs and safety is uh, crucial. And oral calcium channel blockers, nifidipine, nicardipine, beta blockers, labitolol, methyl dopa is recommended as first line treatment for non severe hypertensive disorders. Sublingual or oral nifidipine, IV labitolol, and IV hydralazine are recommended as first line treatment for severe hypertensive disorders. And target blood pressure should be between 150 100 and 110, 80 millimeter mercury, and the maternal hypertension-related placental hyperperfusion remain the real concern. Therefore, blood pressure should be reduced at the rate of approximately one hour during one hour, 25%, followed by a slower rate for targeting blood pressure. Severe hypertension associated with end organ complications such as pulmonary edema or acute kidney injury is considered an emergency and the blood pressure needs to be decreased much faster. Magnesium sulfate reduces the risk of women having further seizures, not to stop seizures. Low dose aspirin recommended for all pregnant women at high risk for preeclampsia can start and administered at 12 weeks to uh, 36 weeks of gestational age. RAS inhibitors AC and ARBs are teratogenic and contraindicated during pregnancy. Methyl dopa recommended discontinued uh, and replaced by other drugs in the postpartum period, and it's associated with the postpartum depression. All her antihypertensive excreted into the breast milk in a low concentration. Hypertensive disorder is now independent risk factor of cardiovascular disease. It has to be taken in consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your excellent lecture, uh, Mongo. And uh, yes, hypertension during pregnancy is a very important uh, risk factor for both mother and children. But and I do not think so many cardiologists are familiar in this field. So I learned a lot from your lecture. Thank you very much. Just my quick question is that uh, in the uh, trial, uh, the strict control of hypertension and uh, not strict, less tight control of hypertension, you describe about the target blood pressure is diastolic blood pressure diastolic. of less than 100 or less than 80. So is there any reason uh, because of the uh, blood flow to the organ is important? So is that the reason why you are targeting the uh, diastolic blood pressure rather than the systolic blood pressure? Yeah, this is uh, the, the study which uh, nicely uh, demonstrated in two arms. One arm was uh, targeting target blood pressure, target diastolic blood pressure to 85 millimeter mercury, 
which considered to be the tight blood pressure control arm. The other arm was uh, designed to a uh, less tight uh, blood pressure control arm, which was uh, considering that diastolic target blood pressure can be around 100 millimeter mercury. That was the study design. And this showed that the more tight group has a, a benefit in regard of reducing um, in regard of reducing risk to uh, progression to the severe uh, hypertension during the pregnancy. Okay, so maybe the diastolic position is one of the important uh, uh, control target. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, is there any comment or question from uh, speaker? One, one question. Yes. Uh, uh, you mentioned about the, uh, uh, we already use nifedipine as the antihypertensive during the pregnancy. But uh, can we use also the amlodipine or lecithipine, the other types of dihydroperitines and the non dihydroperitine calcium channel blockers? Because sometimes the nifedipine is not. Uh, sometimes it is not good enough to control the blood pressure or sometimes it is not available nowadays in our market. So we have to, sometimes we have to uh, use the amlodipine or the lecithipine. These are the now widely used in the other cases of hypertension. So should we use, can we use these agents safely? Um, in a meta-analysis, uh, a result of meta-analysis in a number of studies are showing that Nifedipine, nicardipine is most in the studied uh, among the, um, the pregnant woman uh, indication for HDP. And it is considered to be most safest, best uh, drug for dealing with the hypertensive disorders. But uh, there are also some studies are suggesting that we still have to uh, um, investigate uh, the, the next generation of calcium channel blockers in, um, in this uh, substance of people in order to prove that it's uh, um, the higher effic efficiency in, in uh, such a group of patients. But currently we can only uh, refer that the most uh, studied and uh, proved that uh, the safety of nifedipine and nicardipine. Okay, is there any comment from uh, President Jack and uh, uh, So uh, maybe yes. um, just one quick question. I always have this issue of advising patients if they have antenatal hypertension, they want to get pregnant, and a lot of our young patients are on ACE and ARB. Uh, you do a conversion, and how do you usually switch? Do you usually switch therapy or you, you yes. don't advise it? It recommended to switch therapy. Uh, that's why it's important to pre-pregnancy counseling is is uh, crucial in order to have a less uh, problem uh, during the pregnancy. So um, the number of studies in the statements are uh, recommending that uh, a screening uh, uh, pregnancy age uh, women as much as uh, in a la large scale, in order to identify who is hypertensive, who are not, and those who is hypertensive uh, uh, woman needs to be counseled well, advised well in advance. If they are going uh, planning to, to uh, be pregnant, then it needs to be um, have it needs to be advised to switch uh, drugs to other safer uh, drugs. Thank you. Okay. May I ask a yeah. question? Uh, what is your take about the newer beta blockers like the Nebibolol and Carbidilol? Do you have any experience or? Well, uh, myself, no, uh, not much experience, but we are um, in Mongolia, we are um, strictly advised from the Ministry of Health to uh, follow up the WHO's guideline where it says that uh, labitalol is the first line uh, beta blockers in this regard. Thank you. From Dr. Kishin. Um, I have only uh, 
I have a simple question. Uh, okay. How to uh, detect the uh, hypertension in pregnancy uh, before the uh, uh, pregnancy? Uh, what is uh, the best uh, predictive markers or predictive critical markers? Is there any the, uh, surrogate marker or is there any uh, uh, Im imaging? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, identifying uh, a woman with pre-existing hypertension is more um, more uh, the uh, problem of uh, the organizations and uh, even uh, I would say governments uh, health policies in this way. So. Um, as hypertensive disorders uh, in, of pregnancy is, is becoming a major uh, independent uh, risk factor for women's life to develop uh, cardiovascular disease, it is a concern of the health institutions to screen a uh, um, young woman uh, before pregnancy uh, or the pregnancy age woman, uh, the young woman for uh, probability or planning for the pregnancy in the advice and pre counsel well in advance uh, by screening. Uh, in my opinion, this is the only way to, um, the screening is the only way to uh, identify those who are at risk. Otherwise, um, also, um, the, the, um, we uh, should not forget about um, the, the risk of uh, hypertension in generally not on the not on the for women and generally the hypertension is the first killer it needs to be advocated well enough before um, before pregnancy or after pregnancy the whole population needs to have increased uh, the knowledge about the hypertension and what are the risk uh, it's uh, taking with it so this is the only answer from my side. Thank you very much for your excellent lecture. This is a very important topic, but uh, we do not have enough time. Uh, we need to learn more uh, in future. And also we need uh, a more clinical trial, trial to establish the evidence. Thank you very much for your excellent lecture, uh, Dr. Mongo. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go to the uh, last speaker. Uh, last speaker is uh, Professor uh, Abdullah Al Shafi Majund uh, from Bangladesh uh, Specialized Hospital, uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh. And uh, he is a honorary professor at uh, Popular Medical College. And also, he is a consultant cardiologist at the Bangladesh Specialized Hospital. Uh, uh, he's going to speak about the treatment strategy for hypertension in chronic kidney disease. Uh, Professor Abdullah, please. Yeah, good morning. And I'm audible now. Hello. Oh, okay. Yes, please. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, good morning and thank you, Dr. Kozi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tan, for inviting me. Thank you also to the Taiwan Cardiac Society, Dr. Lin, for extending invitation here. Uh, in the next few minutes, I'll be talking about the treatment strategy for hypertension in the chronic kidney disease. I am nothing to disclose. And the, though it appears to be very simple thing, one dimensional, actually it is not because the, neither the hypertension nor the chronic kidney disease denote a single or fixed entity. Rather, they belong to different shades and hypertension is graded and it stays according to the blood pressure by different bodies and societies. And frequently they are not uh, consistent. And the method of measuring blood pressure, office blood pressure, ambulatory blood pressure, home blood pressure measuring, and also matters regarding the labeling as the person as the hypertensive. And chronic kidney disease is also not a single entity. It is also staged into five entities that are mostly acceptable by all the authors. 
Thus, management strategy of hypertension with chronic kidney disease entails the consideration of the level of the blood pressure along with the staging of the chronic kidney disease. The relationship between the hypertension and chronic kidney disease in, is interdependent. The hypertension causes the chronic disease, persistent hypertension results in the chronic kidney disease, and the chronic kidney disease by itself results in the rise of the blood pressure. So this, uh, this problem was alerted as long as back as in 2009 to coin the slogan that the, the marriage between the chronic kidney disease and hypertension should be prevented. That was the message in 2009 on the World Kidney Day and protect your kidneys, keep your pressure down because the kidney is both a cause and victim of hypertension. So treatment of hypertension has become the most important intervention in the management of all forms of the chronic kidney disease. And the kidney disease is staged one, two, three, four, five. One is actually the uh, just kidney damage as, as evident by the proteinuria or the imaging or biopsy, but the GFR is normal, more than 90 ml. The stage two is the mildly decreased GFR, 60 to 90, and the moderately decreased the 30 to 59, and the severely decreased 15 to 29, and any stage renal failure or the kidney failure is less than 15. So usually in the practically, clinically, a persistent reduction in the GFR to less than 60 ml per minute per square, 1.73 square meter is defined as the chronic kidney disease. And the classification of the hypertension, recently published hypertension guideline by the International Society of Hypertension, published just June 2020, they consider the normal as the less than 130 by 85, and high normal is 130, 139 to 85 to 89. And the when the pressure is 140, above 140 or and above 90 diastole, it is called the hypertension and the graded one and two. More than 160 and 100 is considered as the grade two and the below that is the grade one hypertension. But see that they also set a criteria for the di <coughs> diagnosis of the hypertension based on the office ambulatory and the home blood pressure. The office blood pressure is the less than 140 by less than 140 by 90 is considered as the hypertension. More than 140 by more than 90 is considered as the hypertension. But in the ambulatory blood pressure, look at it, the nighttime blood pressure, a sleep average, more than 120 and one, more than 170 millimeter mercury is considered as the hypertension. And the home blood pressure, more than or equal to 135 or 85 or more is considered as the hypertension. So the methods of measures also matters. And this is the importance of the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring in predicting the uh, prognosis. There is a study which is published in uh, uh, 2006. There is a cohort of the 217 patients with the chronic kidney disease, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and clinic blood pressure was measured and the follow-up was made on the 3.5 years composite end point was the end stage renal disease or death. And it is found that the blood pressure obtained by the amb amb ambulatory monitoring are a stronger uh, predictor of the end stage renal disease and death compared to the blood pressure obtained from the office or the clinic. And the non-deeping has been associated with the greater prevalence of the left ventricular failure and poorer cardiovascular outcome. So the, the, there also there is a statement in the published in the American Journal of Kidney Diseases that is a stronger association between the blood pressure obtained from the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring with cardiovascular and renal outcome. That is 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure has been considered the preferred metric of blood pressure, particularly in cases of the chronic kidney disease. Ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is necessary because there is increased incidence of the white coat and masked hypertension. Also, there is a more incidence of the nocturnal hypertension, non dipping status, masked hypertension. So there is a higher risk of progression to the chronic kidney disease and the cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> so they advocated for the ambulatory blood pressure, preference of the ambulatory blood pressure over the official clinic blood pressure. And these are the different uh, guidelines 
or they defined the blood pressure in different way, SEC guideline in 2017 and the ESC guidelines on the 2018, there is in some discrepancy that the in the SEC, the stage one is considered as 130 to 139 millimeter mercury systolic and 80 to 89 is considered as the stage one hypertension and more than that is the stage two. But look at the ESC guideline. ESC guideline, the high normal, that which one is the, uh, sorry, which one is considered as the stage one hypertension? In the ESC guideline, it is considered as the high normal blood pressure. And they, above that, they graded the hypertension into grade one, grade two, and grade three. But this one, the also in the included in the ESC guideline in 2018, they, they have a good idea that not only the level of the blood pressure is important, this is important, but the, this is also in view of the presence of the other risk factors which matters regarding the risk of the patient. As for example, you see there is a no other risk factor. If the patient has got only the uh, high blood, uh, only the blood, uh, hypertensive, but no other risk factor, then even when the blood pressure is more than one, uh, sorry, when the blood pressure is 180 by more than 110, the patient is on the high risk. But the, when the stage three, stage three means established cardiovascular disease, chronic uh, kidney disease grade four or five, and diabetes mellitus of the uh, organ damage, even when the blood pressure is 130 to 139 and 85 to 29, that is the high number of blood pressure, the patients are at very high risk. So we have to consider the level grading of the blood pressure in one side and also the staging depending on the presence of the number of the risk factors. So this is a very good practical approach to management of the blood pressure. And it rightly pointed out that the presence of the chronic kidney disease is the stage two, grade three is the stage two and grade four or five is the stage uh, three. And so they are at the very high risk even when the blood pressure is the high normal. And the prevalence of the hypertension in the, uh, uh, as the glomerular filtration rate decreases, it shows that when the uh, more than 90 ml uh, per minute, the hypertension rate is around 20% is the uh, usual, the, the community level in, uh, prevalence of the hypertension. But gradually, as the GFR decreases, the prevalence is increases so much so that the, when the, it is stays uh, four, uh, the, uh, prevalence of the hypertension is as high as near about 80%. So prevalence rate of the hypertension in CKD is 60 to 90% depending on, depending on, uh, <clears throat> depending on the stages of the CKD. And what is the mechanism of the uh, development of the hypertension and the chronic kidney disease. Mechanism is the fluid and salt overload, activation of the renin angiotensin uh, uh, aldosterone system, activation of the sympathetic nervous system, and endothelial dysfunctions. These things are depicted schematically this way. Whenever there is a chronic kidney disease, there is a loss of the renal uh, nephrons, and they result in the or in the endothelial dysfunction, there's an the endothelial dysfunction, there is the increased renin production, there is a decreased sodium excretion, and also there's the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. All these are activated. So resulting in the increased peripheral constriction, increased sodium absorption, and the increased sodium retention, and the increased arterial stiffness, resulting in the extracellular volume expansion, all this leads to the increased system blood pressure. So this is the mechanism, how the blood pressure develops due to the chronic kidney disease. And again, what, uh, the hypertension from the kidney disease and hypertension is a major risk factor in the progression of the chronic kidney disease, the other way. Well, how it occurs? Because the autoregulatory process of maintaining the interglomerular pressure, which is the inherent of the kidney, is lost due to the consistent raised systemic blood pressure, leading to the raised glomerular pressure, nephrosclerosis, and progressive loss of renal function. So this is the way the hypertension causes the chronic uh, kidney, uh, the chronic kidney disease results in the hypertension.
So hypertension is a major risk factor for the development and progression of the albuminuria and any form of the chronic kidney disease and the effects of the blood pressure lowering on the renal function and albuminuria dissociated from cardiovascular benefit. And the EGFR, microalbuminuria, and blood electrolytes should be monitored. This is the recommendation from the recent published guideline by the International Society of the Hypertension. <clears throat> they further said the lower EGFR is associated with the resistant hypertension, masked hypertension, and elevated nighttime blood pressure values. And blood pressure should be lowered 140 to uh, if the, it is more than 140 or 90 minute of mercury and treated to a target to less than 130 by 80 minute of mercury in the elderly patient, uh, the systolic pressure may be uh, a bit higher, less than 140. And their, their recommendation is the RAS inhibitors are the first nine drugs because they reduce albuminuria in addition to the blood pressure control. And the CCBs and the diuretics may be used along with the RAS inhibitors where necessary. And the ESC guideline, that the statement of the ESC guidelines of the chronic kidney disease with hypertension, they found that the hypertension is the second most important cause of the CKD after diabetes. And hypertension may also be the presenting feature of the asymptomatic primary renal disease. And the diagnosis of the hypertension-induced renal damage is based on the finding of the reduced renal function and or detection of the albuminuria. The important point to note that the blood pressure reduction by the antihypertensive treatment often leads to an acute increase in the serum creatinine by as much as 20 to 30 percent, especially with the renal angiotensin system blockers, which has a functional basis and does not usually reflect the manifest renal injury, which I, we encounter uh, frequently in our clinical practice that after lowering the blood pressure, the serum creatinine uh, rises. So a lower EHF, uh, sorry. The albumin creatinine ratio is measured from a spot urine sample, which is now available, and progressive reduction in EGFR and increased albuminuria indicates progressive loss of renal function. And serum creatinine, they also suggest, as the uh, International Society of Hypertension, ESC guideline also suggests to measure the serum creatinine, EGFR, and albumin creatinine ratio in all the patients of the, uh, with hypertension. And this is the class one indication of the measurement of the serum creatinine and EGFR. The class one indication to measurement of the urine albumin creatinine ratio and renal ultrasound and Doppler examination should also be considered in patient with the impaired renal function. It is a class two indication. These are the very difficult to treat hypertension. There is a two types, the resistant hypertension, that is the, those who receive the three or more antihypertensive agents, one of which is the diuretic without adequate BP control. Another is the refractory hypertension, receiving three or more antihypertension, one of which is a thiazide diuretic, and another of which is spinolactone without the adequate control of the blood pressure. And it is resistant and refractory hypertension in chronic kidney disease are common, especially in these stages four and five. Uh, these are the general outline of the management of the hypertension by the ESC guideline. You see everywhere there is a lifestyle advices there, and whenever there is a grade one hypertension or the, even the high normal hypertension, is when there is a risk factor such as the cardiovascular disease or the kidney disease or the hypertension mediated organ damage, then we have to start the drug treatment even at the lower level of the hypertension. And they nicely they made an algorithm of the hypertension with the chronic kidney disease. The, the initial therapy is the AC inhibitors or ERBs plus calcium channel blockers or AC inhibitors or ERBs plus diuretic, uh, particularly loop diuretic in case of the uh, stage four or five. And the, if necessary, we have to go to the step two where the, these all the three drugs are combined, AC inhibitors or ERB plus CCB plus diuretic. And the step three is the resistant hypertension where we, we have to use the spironolactone or other diuretics, alpha blockers or beta blockers. So this is the good uh, uh, algorithm for the practitioners to follow. And uh, mind it, the loop diuretics may be, are used when the, the EGFR is uh, reduced to less than 30 ml per minute. 
is the uh, recommendation, class one, the office blood pressure, when there is a more than 140 by 90 millimeter marker, you have to initiate the antihepatitis uh, treatment, life system modification and drug therapy, uh, chronic kidney disease with or without diabetes, lower blood pressure to 130 to 139 millimeter marker, systolic blood pressure, it is the class one, RAS blockers are recommended in the presence of proteinuria or albuminuria, it is also class one. And RAS blockers in combination with CCBs and directories to be the initial therapy while necessary is also the class one. But mind it, the individualized treatment according to the tolerability and the impact on the renal function and the electrolytes are appropriate. The, they showed that the, in meta analysis, the BP lowering significantly reduced the NSTS renal disease in patients with CKD but only in those with the albuminuria and without any beneficial effect on the uh, CBFNs. And current evidence suggests that in patients with the chronic kidney disease, BP should be lowered to less than 140 by 90 millimeter mercury and towards the 130 by 80 millimeter mercury. And another point is important that sodium restriction may be especially effective in aiding blood pressure lowering in patients with the CKD as there is a retention of sodium and fluid in the pathogenesis as I showed before in the pathogenesis of the hypertension of the CKD. And the, the statement from the SEC guideline, which is published in 2017, they also reported that the as a hypertension is reported in 67 to 92% of the patients with the CKD with increasing prevalence as kidney function declines. And the mass hypertension, they uh, stated that occur in up to 30% of the patients with the CKD and the portends high risk of the uh, CKD progression. So CKD is an important risk factor for the cardiovascular disease in the other way also. Coexistence of the hypertension and the chronic kidney disease further increases the risk of adverse cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events, particularly when proteinuria is present. So most patients of the uh, chronic kidney disease die from the cardiovascular complications. This is a very important point to remember. The cardiovascular complications are the main uh, point of death from the chronic kidney disease. Lower target of less than 130 by 80 for all patients with the CKD. But the incremental BP reduction may be appropriate because the careful monitoring of the physical and kidney function assessment is necessary. Their recommendation is class one is the adults with hypertension and CKD should be treated to a BP goal of less than 130 by 80 millimeter market. It is similar with the European guideline. And in adults in the hypertension with CKD, they advocate the AC inhibitors to slow kidney disease progression. It is a class 2A and the ERP in place of the AC inhibitors if in tolerant patients, it is a class 2B. So and AC inhibitors or ARB is a preferred drug for treatment of hypertension if albuminuria and serum, they also mentioned that the serum creatinine may increase up to 30% because of the concurrent reduction in the GFR. Reduction of the GFR that occurred during the intensive PP is largely the hemodynamic effects other than the kidney injury. But if the GFR is reduced further, then further investigation are advocated. Their algorithm is that the PP goal is 130 by 80, class one indication, we have to start the treatment to re reduce the blood pressure uh, to below the 130 by 80. If there is a albuminuria, then S inhibitor is class two indicated, and if no, the other first line drugs may be used. And the, this is the guideline, which is the from the kidney people, the uh, kidney uh, diseases improvement global outcome, they have got their uh, on guideline, they depending on the albuminuria. If there is a less than 30 milligram albuminuria, then BP target is less than 140 by 90 with any, without any preferred agent. If the 30 to 30 milligram or more than 30, the BP target is less than 130 by 80, and AC inhibitors are ARBs are the preferred agent. The recommendation is irrespective of the presence or absence of the diabetes, no recommendation given by them for the stage five or the ESRD and the stage renal disease. So the, this is a this is an uh, statement at the, from the European group, a group of uh, authors, they, uh, their recommendation in the case of the 
patients of the dialysis, non-pharmacological intervention targeting sodium and volume excess are fundamental for BP reduction in this population. They recommend use of beta blockers followed by the dihydropyridines. CCB should be considered. The first line use of AC inhibitors in ERBs in this population is not supported by the randomized trials. The safety profile of the mineral receptor uh, antagonist in the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist in the dialysis population are being studied but need further investigation to weigh benefits but adverse effects. Properly designed epidemiology studies and clinical trials are necessary to further uh, recommendation on these patients. So most uh, in the transplant patient, most studies favor the CCBs to reduce graft loss and maintain higher GFR and with some evidence suggesting that the, there may be potential harm from the AC inhibitors. There is another interesting paper that the, there may be role of uric acid lowering therapies in the management of hypertension in addition to the prevention of the CKD, but there is no further, uh, many further um, comments on this paper. They found that the hypertension increased by 13% per one milligram per deciliter in case of the serum uric acid. They have from the 18 prospective cohort studies and the baseline serum uric acid more than 6.5 milligram per deciliter had a 25 increased risk of hypertension. So, my dear uh, fellow colleagues and the friends, uh, the at the end of this uh, presentation, my take home message is hypertension leads to chronic kidney disease and chronic kidney disease complicates with development of hypertension. Target office blood pressure is set at less than 130 by 80 millimeter mercury in CKD patient with or without diabetes, according to the major guidelines. Mask hypertension and nocturnal hypertension is reported in a significant number of the patient of the chronic kidney disease. So ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is advocated for managing hypertension in the CKD group of patients. And the dietary salt restriction and appropriate diuretic therapy make up the mainstay of the hypertension treatment. RAS inhibitors are recommended agents in the CKD patient with albuminuria. Fall of blood pressure may be associated with functional rise of the serum creatinine with fall of GFR up to 30%. RAS inhibitors may be combined with CCBs and diuretics in the necessary, if necess necessary. And bedtime dosing may help in non-dipping cases. Resistant and refractory hypertension are frequently encountered in the uh, chronic kidney disease patients. Thank you very much for the patient hearing. Bangladesh welcomes you to look at the sea beach at Cox's Bazaar and the Sundarbans, the home of Royal Bengal Tigers. Welcome to Bangladesh. Thank you very much for the patient hearing. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Abdullah, uh, and uh, very much enjoyed your talk. And uh, I have a question on the clinical practice. Sometimes the CKD is uh, the end stage, for example, uh, let's say serum creatine level is more than three. If we uh, decrease the uh, hypertension, blood pressure, the serum creatine more increase. And, and you said that it does not always mean the uh, red uh, kidney injury, but do you think we have better keep the blood pressure relatively high level in patient with end stage renal failure, or should we keep the low blood pressure even though uh, in patient with end stage renal failure? Do you have any comment on that? Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Kozi. Very, very nice uh, question because I also thought about it. Uh, the thing is that. There is a lot of studies for the last two or three decades. There is a lot of studies of how much blood pressure should be reduced or not. It has been found that there is a no harm of reducing the blood pressure below 130 by 80. Rather, it decreases the progression of the renal disease as well as the progression of the other cardiovascular and the cerebrovascular complications. And the rise of the serum creatinine is expected up to 20, some say up to 30% without any kidney injury. Rather, it, it reflects the functional uh, effects or hemodynamic effects of the lowering of the blood pressure. And the suggestion is that if the, uh, the creatine level rises more than 20% or 30%, then we have to investigate whether the, there is any, any kidney, further kidney damage or not. If no, then we should not be worried about it. We should, be, we should think that the beneficial effects are more than the concern about the rise of the creatine. 
this is my my idea and the, you see the patient on the th uh, fifth stage that is the any stage renal disease this is very uh, controversial still now and the particularly the patient who are on the dialysis and the there is a no robust data about the antihypertensive management in the patients on the dialysis but they, as i showed that there is a consensus statement from a different groups of people from europe who suggested to use the beta blockers calcium channel blockers rather than the ac inhibitors to where be in cases of the patients to the end stage renal disease I have a question, Koji. Lord's here. Yeah. Yes, uh, yours. Welcome. Congratulations, uh, Professor Shafi. In the use of uh, antihypertensive drugs uh, like hydrochlorothiazide, how far is it effective uh, in basing on the GFR level of the patient? Is it okay. if the GFR is very, very low? Or... Yeah, as I, as I showed that the up to 30 ml per minute per uh, square meter, 1.73 square meter, we, have, we can use the thiazide diuretics. Uh, but uh, below that, we have to switch over to the loop diuretics. Uh, I have already showed in the in, in one slide. Uh, so, and the, regarding this spinolacto, this is a very, uh, a very critical way to use it. In the resistant hypertension, uh, you have to use the spinolactone to lower the blood pressure, but you have to keep in mind about the level of the potassium and the uh, particularly the potassium. So even then, this is not contraindicated. Rather, use is with the caution and the follow-up and monitoring. Thank you. Is there any comment from Mongol or uh, Dr. Kishi or? Yeah, I have a one question. And uh, Professor, um, what type of uh, antihypertensive drugs you would uh, advise for uh, secondary hypertension, let's say with the uh, uh, chronic kidney disease? Nick, chronic kidney disease, it is the AC, a, a RAS inhibitors, AC inhibitors and ARBs. But I think you, you are also thinking about the renovascular hypertension. Yes. So when there is a, a rise of the creatinine following the use of the RAS inhibitors, then we have to uh, check whether we are dealing with the patients of the secondary hypertension with the renal artery stenosis. In those cases, we have to, these this are the contraindicated in those cases. So mm -hmm. uh, secondary hypertension, we have to find out what are the causes of the secondary hypertension. And the renovascular is one of the important causes. Then we have to uh, avoid to use the RAS inhibitors. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Do you have any comment from Dr. Kishi or? Thank no? you. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Uh, how do you talk about the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, uh, in the spectrum treatment of hypertension CKD? Uh, because uh, for our cardiologist, uh, several recent uh, clinical trials indicated that uh, the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors has a beneficial effect uh, for the hypertension and the CKDs uh, with and without diabetes. So uh, what do you think about the uh, benefit of the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, to the hypertension and the CKDs? I, I think SGLT2 inhibitors are the, have got the hypertensive effect, but in the, uh, it is not yet recommended by any major bodies or societies, uh, 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 or, or the, uh, not by the approved by the uh, uh, FDA or so, as it is uh, 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 recommended or the uh, approved for the heart failure patients, but for the, anti, as an antihypertensive, I think we have to yet wait to see the, uh, the results of the uh, other trials to see if the SGL2 inhibitors can be a good choice of anti But uh, in my clinical practice, you see uh, uh, off-level use. I, uh, I sometimes use the, in diabetic patient particularly, I increase the dose of the uh, empagliflozine from 10 to 25 millimeter mercury when I need a slight decrease of the blood pressure. Then I found it very useful, but it is a, it is not uh, yet uh, advocated or recommended yet. But uh, data will show, I think, 
uh, definitely it will be a uh, positive effect on the lowering of the blood pressure and the CKD patient may be benefited with the HGLT2 inhibitors, but it is not yet advocated by the approved bodies or societies. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Bangladesh and all of the speakers for excellent lecture and uh, Professor uh, President Jackdown for the chair. And finally, uh, I greatly appreciate the uh, Professor uh, Jun Li Lin, Taiwan Heart Foundation, to organize this excellent webinar. Uh, the Professor uh, Lin, do you have uh, any comment uh, in the last? <laughs> oh, it's muted. Please unmute. Professor Lin, you have to be unmuted. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it, you hear you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you all of you to attend the uh, webinars, and uh, I really have learned a lot from all of you actually. <laughs> so, uh, well, I think uh, I will also welcome all of you to next week. We are the part two of the dilemmas <laughs> of hypertension. Uh, you will be uh, very much interested as well. And uh, I must uh, so I have a BB closure to uh, Professor Patrikawa, please. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Lin. And uh, I think uh, the time has uh, already passed 2 p.m. Uh, so it's now time to close. And thank you very much for thank you. all. Uh, it, it was a very excellent uh, web seminar. As, uh, looking thank forward you. to uh, the next week webinar too. Uh, thank you very much for all. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank thank you. You. See, you later. See you later. See you later. Okay, okay.